How do countries get their names? Who gets to make the decision? There's legacy and legitimacy in claiming a title. Apologies to anyone who saw a video titled Rome by Any Other Name and thought this was going to be a dive into the alt history where Remus was the better brother and we got the city of Reem. No, this is about Byzantium and why we call it that. Why Rome ended sometime in the late 5th century when an entire state that called itself the Roman Empire existed for another thousand years after that. Moving forward, every time I say Byzantium, I mean the empire, and every time I say Byzantian, I mean the city yet to be known as Constantinople. Like Londinium for London, the root for Byzantian is entirely forgotten and left to speculation. And while confounding to etymology enthusiasts, the absence of an alternative meaning, in some way, allowed the location to stand with a unique name. London doesn't just mean, like, river town or something, and much the same to Byzantium, the city that would someday become Constantinople and eventually Istanbul. The name for the Byzantine Empire comes from the settlement. It is, in effect, associating the capital with the country, mirroring Rome in a way. But while Rome grew from a city-state kingdom to a republic into a continent-spanning empire, keeping its name despite changing capitals more than once, Byzantium was simply chosen as a capital with the refounding and renaming of the city by the Emperor Constantine in 330 AD during the time of Eastern and Western Rome. To give a very, very short history of how the Byzantine state emerges, Rome divides itself into two administrative regions, cooperating as one empire, essentially. If you've seen my video on the game Imperator, think of it like empowering a second emperor, granting Imperium to a co-ruler. Now, as time goes on and history marches forward, the western half of the empire collapses. That's what we refer to, for reasons, as the fall of Rome. By now, something might strike you as a bit odd. The Byzantines called their own capital Constantinople before they were even the only Rome. So how did the name Byzantine come to signify the whole empire? Justinian I, yes, Justinian and Theodora Justinian, famously was the last emperor to speak both Latin and Greek, which indicates the transition from a Rome-centric empire to a Greek empire better than I think any single map ever could. Further, there's a historical concept, a phrase that gets thrown around called Last of the Romans. Justinian is counted among them. For our purposes, the relevant element isn't just that Justinian makes the list. It's that other than some disconnected use by the British, the term tends to cluster its use around the 4th to 6th century CE among Romans. This page also has this funny long-winded heading that I can't help sharing list of rulers who, in a more literal sense, also could be described as last of the Romans. Someone was having fun with this. As for the Greeks themselves, even as Latin faded from public use entirely, the common name for the empire among Greek-speaking people was, forgive my pronunciation, Basileia Romaeon, and their people, Romoi. So if they're the Romans, how do they refer to the other Romes? The Byzantines fluctuated between various names for their imperial competitor, the Holy Roman Empire, usually referring to them as a Germanic or Frankish kingdom, which, to be completely fair, is correct to reality. But maybe not a shot they should take once they all switch to Greek as their primary language. From looking at a couple primary sources of the era, which... Oh, okay, can I complain for a second? It isn't difficult to find these if you know what you're looking for and you want a version already translated into English. But if you want the original text, good luck, buddy. It's like, here, have an 1864 publication that transcribed it from, I don't even know, a manuscript someone never archived, some random parchment? It's a slog sometimes to find a copy of the original, which I suppose means it's fine to take it on faith that these things are accurate and real. Which I would have done, but this process was about looking for exact wording in Latin. So, yeah. 
From looking at primary sources of the era, we can see how people beyond the Byzantine Empire referred to the Byzantines. The most common I found was just calling them the Greeks. After the fall of Constantinople, you start to see them referred to retrospectively as the Byzantines, and that's how we get to our contemporary distinction. There's even an argument that Byzantium, as a term for the empire, predates the normally supposed use sometime in the 1500s, following their collapse. Granted, I couldn't read the source because it's paywalled, but the abstract is enough that I trust it's at least got a basis. Now don't get me wrong, it's a useful title in some ways. Byzantine culture has some strong distinctions from Hellenic Greek culture and from Western Rome. Language is probably the biggest distinction and the one that kind of spirals out. The Byzantine Greeks, as I said before, referred to themselves as Roman, but doubtless they knew themselves to be a Greek people. They knew what language they were speaking. As with many historical divides, part of this revolved around the religious divide between the Greek Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church. Catholics, of course, having control over Rome the city, had quite the argument for being able to deign Roman successors. Then again, the Romans were never Catholic, so… hmm. Ultimately, when the Catholic West is given the ability to redefine the region of Byzantium with the establishment of the Latin Empire, they didn't. Now, as for why the French Crusader states established the Romanian slash Latin Empire rather than another Roman one, it was a political choice. The Latin Empire is a conscious distinction. Let's talk for a second about the other Romes. The Latin Empire and the Holy Roman Empire. Holy Roman Emperors styled themselves as Imperator Augustus for the most of the existence of the Empire as seen with this Louis example in 817 CE. Now why would they do this? Why be Roman? Was Regna Germania not enough of a title? The concept of claiming Roman legacy is so pervasive in European culture that it has its own term and Wikipedia page, Translatio Imperi. The history of the term includes such transitive examples as Thrace into Norway, as well as some more arguable ones. The claim to a title was a powerful political tool that had everything to do with legitimacy, legacy, and authority. This is, in turn, the very same reason the Latin Empire was referred to as such, or as Romania. Anything so long as it wasn't Rome. The Latin Empire was not about to anger the HRE by laying claim to Roman authority, so they chose an adjacent name. As a silly comparison, think of it like bootlegging slash copyright avoidance, but for international relations. For a more serious and grounded one, we have modern examples of this with two Chinas and the significance of being China. Fundamental to all of this is the way Roman Empire and Emperor function as titles. There can only be one empire. Period. Full stop. The Roman Empire is the sole empire that exists. From this comes the problem of two emperors. To demonstrate how serious and exact states were about this issue of a name, we only have to look so far as the conflict between the Latin and Holy Roman Empires. Despite taking a different name and sharing a religion, seemingly resolving all the issues, the Latin Empire, in claiming emperorship, still butted heads with the HRE. Once you understand that, it starts to make sense why the Byzantines are referred to as they are, sometimes as the Greeks, sometimes as Byzantium, but never really as Romans as they would prefer. There's power in that title, a special legitimacy that was also sought by the Holy Roman Empire, which is, in a now tired truism, joked to be neither holy, nor Roman, nor an empire. Briefly, the joke to me really only serves to highlight the plasticity of the word empire, which is ironic given how important it was to those who styled themselves as such. The Ottomans, it turns out, would even claim the title of successors to the Romans, Rum, and as such, did not refer to the Austrian emperors as anything more than king for over a hundred years. To be fair to the Ottomans, they did conquer the last guys who called themselves the Roman Empire, where the HRE simply had permission from the Pope, who, in terms of his authority to decide what is truly Roman, well, that just goes back to the earlier religious divide. Ultimately, the reason for seeking the legacy was the same for the Germans as it was for the Franks as for the Ottomans. There is power in that name. 
and step one to taking the name is to refuse to admit someone is already using it. So the short answer of it all is that the reasons are a touch historical, a bit cultural, and primarily political. Anyone with a vested interest in the legacy of Rome was bound to take that title, and they weren't going to share. As a point of clarity, I will say it makes sense for us to use the term Byzantine now, in that it does help us distinguish a culture and an empire. It gives us a word for a place, time, and people, and speaking generally, we don't tend to refer to countries by names that require geographic designations relative to something that no longer exists. And it would lead to using the term East Rome when there was no West Rome. Or I don't know if that's a fair argument, because we certainly call the HRE what they'd want to be called. We don't just insist that they're the Germanian Empire or something. We don't take a former name of one of the capitals and apply it to a whole broader political body. The HRE wasn't the Vindonian Empire, a la the Byzantian Byzantium pattern. Final verdict. It's fine to use the word Byzantium, no one's wrong to do so, and we don't need to rethink how we use the term so much as think when we use it. In a future video, I might discuss the ways we divide up history. In fact, it's inevitable that I do so in an upcoming one I already have planned. It's been a while since I felt the need to really do a more research-driven video and engage in history history as opposed to game mechanics. It's also a perfect bridge into talking about when history goes very wrong, both in what that looks like and the impact that it has. That's going to be its own entire video and part of a series where I talk about academic historical concepts through the medium of games. In terms of style, I've been told it's somewhere adjacent to critiques that teach, like Dan Olson's content, but for games and history, if that's not too bold a comparison. Subscribe and stick around if you want to see that. Otherwise, I hope you learn something and bother your friends with it.